Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you for, for coming. Let's, if I could ask that you find a seat, because uh, I will tell you, the ambassador's on the way. He was, uh, he was on the Excella. That was, of course, you know the Excella, you know? And uh, it'll get you there when it gets you there. Uh, but he has arrived. He should be here in just a few minutes. But because uh, Ambassador Armitage has to leave, I thought, we'll, if you'll just please indulge us and let us uh, have Ambassador Westmacott just join us in progress. And I wanted to get started. Besides, I'm going to blather on for a few minutes and, and at least tell you why I think we're here. And, uh, and then probably by the time I get done, the ambassador will be here. And we can turn to the two experts that we brought here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I, this has been something I've personally been quite interested in for quite a while. I mean, in fact, I first had a conversation with uh, with, the, with uh, Secretary Panetta about this idea uh, almost three years ago. Um, and let me just give a, a bit of a frame to explain what uh, what what's behind this. Uh, it, the reason I invested Peter, by the way, was because it was stimulated by something our friends in the UK had done. Uh, you'll remember our, our, our buddies from the United Kingdom had a program called uh, Nimrod. You remember Nimrod got in a little bit of trouble, and it got too expensive, and it just wasn't, wasn't going to make it. And so they made a hard choice. It was a brave choice. And that was to, uh, to cancel Nimrod, and then to, in its place, buy three rivet joint aircraft, exactly in the same configuration as the 18 rivet joint aircraft that we have. We couldn't find three crappy old airplanes like the ones we used, but we, we lined them up, you know, and of course that's one of the first complaints they had, is we, you know, we made them identical and they're really old. But, the, but it was an important insight into something. Uh, and that is when two allies can operate the same hardware, we can avoid the back office costs of having infrastructure so that our friends in the UK can put their dollars behind the fighting end of a river joint and not have to worry about the schoolhouse and the depot support system, etc. Now, of course, there was a, a bargain we had to strike with this. Uh, which is that obviously if the United Kingdom is going to buy our aircraft, we have to guarantee them a production right for the modernization of the entire fleet, which is fair. I mean, that's part of this, a partnership. Now, uh, that idea caused me to start thinking about this whole issue of industrial collaboration and alliance partnerships in a very different way. Uh, we need to start thinking, the world's getting is no smaller. There certainly aren't any fewer bad guys in the world. Aren't you glad you're not, you're first, you're not from the Kim family, huh? Uh, we got some real wackos out there uh, and threatening to the United States and to our allies. And we get, we're, our budgets are under a lot of pressure. Our budgets here, budgets in the UK, everywhere. Our closest friends are struggling just as we are. We cannot afford to do business the way we used to do business. And there's an opportunity if we decide that we're going to become federated forces. Now, I use the term federated uh, because I think it's meant to signal we both come as equal partners here. This isn't a big brother, little brother arrangement. We are equal partners. We need the United Kingdom to be our partner on rivet joint. And we've made them essential for the future for that program. And we need to start thinking about this as a new way to think about how we work with allies around the world and friends around the world. We tend to have a pretty deep paternalism about our relations with partner countries. Um, yeah, we're willing to let you buy our stuff, but not our, really our good stuff. You know, I mean, we're going to keep that for ourselves. Well, I mean, there was once a time, maybe, when, uh, when we had to worry about industrial loss of you know, key technology. But these are our finest allies. These allies care just as much about this mission as we do, certainly as much. as, they, And they have strong control systems. We are not at risk by sharing frontline technology with these allies. And we need to mature, honestly, on our side. If we're going to ask them to fight with us, side by side, 
then we need to start letting them have the kinds of things that it takes to be our partner on that battlefield. So there's a lot that we have to start working through here. I'd also say that there's a related dimension uh, to this idea, and that is this, and we're facing it really in Asia. Um, you know, for 60 years, our approach to uh, forward presence has been through creating big American installations overseas. You know, there are two ways that we send Americans overseas, you know, military. PCS, permanent change of station, and TDY, temporary duty. And, of course, permanent change of station means that we send people to big complexes, you know, American outposts. And over time, they become uh, unwelcome neighbors around the world. Um, we've been struggling for 15 years in Okinawa. But what we've uh, learned, for example, with very good friends like the United Arab Emirates, is that if we're willing to be there on a TDY basis, we can be very strong presence in the region. So we need to rethink this whole thing in a very different way. These are countries that can be full partners with us in a shared mission. We see the world the same way. We'll have some differences, obviously, some diplomatic differences. But the content of our goal, as well as with our allies, is so profoundly parallel that we're cheating ourselves if we don't find a way to work together. And that's what the purpose of this effort is going to be. This is what uh, my colleagues and I are going to be working on in the months ahead. Uh, Tonight, I've, you know, we, Peter will be here, uh, Ambassador Westmacott will be here, uh, but I'm very grateful that Rich Armitage has joined us. I've had many conversations with Rich on this. Of course, you all know Ambassador Armitage uh, as, as certainly a, the premier uh, national security leader in Asia for America. This is a, a man who spent more time thinking about, worrying about, nurturing, uh, relationships, building capability in Asia uh, for a greater good, our shared good, than anybody I know. And Rich, we're, we're honored to have you here tonight. We're grateful for what you've done for the country. Let, if, if, I'm going to really make this an interview, and then somehow I'm going to bring Ambassador Westmacott up to speed when he gets in here in the door. But let's start with, with, uh, with you, Rich, and that is to say, I know that you, you travel extensively throughout Asia. All of the countries in Asia are trying to think about how, they, uh, how they're going to develop a security posture uh, for the next 20 years. Would you just share your thinking about this and what they're expecting from us as, as, a, as American partners? Well, what I've heard recently is, for the most part, the so-called rebalancing uh, toward Asia has been welcomed by the great majority of nations, uh, with the exception, of course, of North Korea and China, who has some real and, frankly, well-understood questions uh, about it. But the, the first question that you get from our foreign friends is, what does the U.S. expect of us in the rebalancing? And my answer, uh, frankly, is, well, wrong question. You need to figure out yourself what you're willing to do to help the United States, because the U.S. has not figured this out, hasn't thought it through. As a, as a suggestion that our equities uh, and the strategic weight that the U.S. gives to Asia are greater, the rebalancing is fine, but it is a practical uh, change. Uh, we haven't thought that far ahead. So first of all, nations of Asia will be thinking for themselves uh, what they are willing to do if they want our presence around and if we want us to be involved in the life of the neighborhood. Number two, it's unfortunate, I think, that in the main part, uh, weight has been given to the security equation, and it left out a lot of the other arrows in our quiver, uh, such as uh, in exchanges, such as uh, uh, now we're trying to conclude a TPP, and that's great, uh, such as a foreign direct investment uh, in these foreign countries. So we went to the rebalancing with what we could move quickly, and that is security forces, and left the other arrows back home. And uh, so it, it leads us to be rather unbalanced. As we move forward, and particularly talk about federated defense, John, it occurs to me that we need to, in the first instance, be talking about things that are completely non-threatening. Nobody in Asia wants to get involved in a problem that we may bring about. And they're asked 
15 years or so of U.S. involvement has been a bunch of problems that we brought about, not everybody bought fully into. So I would suggest that a very safe thing to talk about or, or a battle that we all have, and that is against nature, uh, the ability to transport uh, others, maybe understand how much transportation capability exists in the various forces, take an inventory, but do something initially that's very non-threatening and then move forward. And I think that would be both helpful for our friends in the area, but it would also be helpful to us. We realize that we don't have to take the full load of every typhoon in the Philippines or anything else. Richard, let me uh, ask you, I know that you've counseled governments in Asia rather extensively about, you know, working with the United States, buying U.S. equipment, you know, how are we going to be treated if we do that? Are we going to get jerked around? How reliable are you guys really? You know, because you, we saw what you did to Pakistan, you sold them F-16s and pulled the rug out from under them. I mean, you were at the State Department. Uh, you, you saw this from both the DOD perspective and the State Department. Tell, tell me about America's reliability as a partner. Well, it, it, again, it's uh, some schizophrenic on this. Fair. Uh, relationships like the Republic of Korea, like Japan, that are pretty mature, we've had a good relationship for a long time. They have a lot more faith in the ability and a lot more experience in the ability of the United States to deliver once we say something. For other countries, we might from time to time have different problems, Indonesia or, or Malaysia. So their, their experience is a little different, and their experience looking at our export controls and technology transfer regimes uh, would lead them to be a little reluctant to go uh, very far with us because they realize that we can turn around and Congress can turn around on a dime and for human rights or religious freedoms reasons stop the provision of technology so it so I find that our Asian friends on the one hand are appreciative of the fact that we do value human rights and human freedoms religious freedom but they're frightened about being caught in the middle what would what 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 can we do on this because it's uh, you know frequently we impose restrictions on countries because it does, it's the, it doesn't matter and we don't care and it's the least painful thing to do. But then once we do it, we never know how to get out of it. Well, there's the rub, isn't it? John, it, it, it occurs to me, I've spent some time talking about this and thinking about it. I talked to David Berto before the meeting. I will admit to you, I, I came to the Department of State as deputy uh, bathed in the religion of uh, freeing up the export control regimes and making technology transfer decisions that were cogent and correct. And I learned something. That was, and Secretary Powell had the same feeling. But we weren't into the priesthood. We weren't members of the cult. And this is the export control regime, folks. In the Pentagon, you'd call them iron majors. Well, in the State Department, we have iron majors, except they're civilians, whatever, the iron GS-15s or something. And you can have as much zeal and as much energy to try to change the export control regimes, but if you don't speak that language and that jargon, they'll wrap you up in your underwear every single time. So it leads me to the conclusion that the only place that we had success really in moving export control regimes was by a country by country basis. Egypt came to mind, and we were successful in opening up Egypt, it took a lot of energy. It took personal energy from the secretary, from the deputy secretary. It's the only way I was able to get any movement in export control and technology, to get a blanket approach change. You know, there's not enough mm -hmm. days left in my life uh, for that. But a country by country approach, I think you can make, you can become more credible and you can make some significant progress. You know, we, it, it, there were days in the past when we were more clever about how to deal with this. I remember when, uh, when our Dutch allies wanted to buy the P-3, the state-of-the-art P-3, anti-submarine warfare aircraft. And we, our you know, security people, were a little concerned about that. So, but we arranged, made an arrangement that uh, an American officer was assigned to the Dutch P-3 squadron. And his duty was the last thing before the airplane took off was to go on board, put in the tapes, get it running up, up and running, and then let him go on the mission. And then he recovered the tapes at the end of the mission, and, and we secured those separately. Of course, that was the more uh, sophisticated algorithms that were uh, behind the acoustic processing. 
it seems, uh, you know, if we do this carefully and not in, a, in a, an offensive way, it seems to me there are operational solutions to the paranoia that we tend to have about this problem. Did you ever experience some of this when you were at school? Uh, it, it happens all the time, uh, but we're breaking it slowly. Uh, you suggested maybe uh, uh, joint uh, patrols or joint manning of ships and things of this nature. We've got an agreement with the UK on the use of carriers. Uh, it's slowly breaking. Submarines may be the next one, though the submarine community in the United States, in my view, is quite hard-headed uh, and quite closed, and I think that would be a real tough nut. But if we could get the Australians, maybe the Japanese, to be involved in some of these submarine programs, the Japanese, for obvious reasons, have more neuralgia for the nuclear issue. But this might be something uh, where we could really make a big difference. But John, this whole question of federated defense, one of the questions is whether we have to be in the middle of it. We're joined by Hello, the ambassador. Uh, well, you're with Excella. It's Do we understand? It's, no, not even. Some text. The rest of it, whatever it's called, the slow train. The slow train. Is there Peter? How are you? Sir? <laughs> we know. And, and we, I explained to everyone here about that. And thank you so much for persevering. Let me, uh, Rich, why don't you finish your sentence and I'm going to bring the ambassador up to speed so we can. Well, I was thinking you would, often when I think of federated events, I start with the United States. And I don't know that that's always the right place to start with. Uh, first of all, depending on different administrations, they've had different approaches to allies, and some more credible than others. It's not a political statement, it's a practical one. Uh, and federated defense is going to very much be a factor of how much faith our allies have in us. Uh, but at a different level, it's one of the regional and sub-regional level, things are happening. Uh, there's a press release out a couple of days ago from the, the Nordic states who are rolling out a defense uh, roadmap. And they've uh, entered a new phase that unlocks the potential in cross-border collaboration, the five Nordic countries. Uh, it has implications for NATO. It has implications for us. It's a very safe place to begin uh, with air defense and things of that nature for the five of them. And it seems to me that we need to give some consideration to how much uh, we try to foster this kind of sub-regional uh, federated defense. Mm. It's good for them and uh, might ultimately be good for us. This is a very, very good point. Let me, let me get to that question to ask the first question of uh, the ambassador, but let me just frame the conversation because this idea of federated defense really sprung off of uh, the insights I got from what I, what I saw the UK when they decided to abandon the Nimrod program and to buy the rivet joint, into rivet joint. And you, it's a hard thing for a country to do, to, to jettison a program with all of the industrial connections and politics that goes with that and join another country's program, but you did. It was very courageous. Of course, there's a bargain here. We promised to place work with you with the modernization for this fleet. But now, instead of having 18 and you having three, we've got 21 aircraft we can operate together. And there's a capacity. Now, in some ways, this is growing into the defense business what uh, we've done for many years in intelligence cooperation through the Five Eyes system. We really have a federated system that we've developed there. Now, I'd like to just, uh, by way of background, to say this is really a question. Can America start looking at its partnership with allies in a new way, in a bigger way, in a way that's more trustworthy and more intimate so that we can be, see you as a genuine partner and we are a reliable partner on our side. So that's kind of frames the conversation to this point. And uh, before I get to the question Rich just put on, put on the table, which I think is, is really uh, gets to the nub of something quite interesting. Ambassador, let me just ask, I mean, the UK has probably been more forward leaning than any country I know in finding practical ways to collaborate on needed things for the UK. I mean, you, you bought, C-17 airlifters, you bought, uh, you bought uh, uh, the, the, ta the uh, uh, aircraft carrier thing with Brits. I mean, you, you've been remarkably pragmatic. Can you help us understand how you, how you manage this within the United Kingdom? Because you may, you're able to manage the complexities of sovereignty and politics and industrial politics and national security in a much more sophisticated way. And I'd just be curious if you could give us insight into that. Well, thank you very much. And is this working? 
Uh, it it is. I think it's working. Can you all hear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, apologies again for, no, for arriving late. Uh, I'm not sure that we're that much more sophisticated, but I do think that we've developed a, a very useful model for working together in what you might call a federated way, but I'll come back to that word in a moment, but which we would probably regard as a collaborative partnership, primarily uh, with the United States, but not only with the United States. We are doing worthy things, important things, in terms of collaborative defense projects and indeed strategy and indeed um, combined operation capabilities with other partners, particularly with the French, because mm -hmm. we concluded some time ago, and I used to be an ambassador in France, that it wasn't really reasonable to leave the United States shouldering the bulk of the burden or as much of the burden as it was within NATO, and that if the Europeans were going to pull their weight, the main Europeans who have a defense capability and ambition and global reach and tradition and relationships and uh, like to think they can do this stuff are the Brits and the French. And we concluded that we could probably be more effective if we started working uh, together to try to drive down costs, improve interoperability, and develop a habit of doing more stuff together. But to come back to your, your basic point, I think you're right. It, it goes back even to Trident missiles and so on. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Rivet Joint, where we've got a rather remarkable partnership, where we've got a kind of jointly available um, uh, piece of kit. We've bought only three, you've got 18, uh, but they are largely interoperable. Uh, there is work that is done between us on UAVs where sometimes UK tasking in Afghanistan mm -hmm. actually goes to US equipment mm -hmm. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We work very closely. The carrier strike program is another one where we work very closely together. And so is joint strike fighter, the F-35, where there is uh, in exchange, if you like, for a very early commitment to be a kind of co-prime contractor, there's a high level of work share commitment, a joint involvement right from the very beginning, uh, which we think uh, works extremely well. It continues with submarines, mm -hmm. and even mm -hmm. to the extent of design and manufacture of some of the elements of your next generation submarines and ours. So it's something that, that we think works, which helps to uh, improve our ability to work together uh, and to swap stocks and equipment and mutually uh, deploy equipment when we need to, uh, but also we hope uh, to keep down the costs and it facilitates the development of a partnership when we need to go in and do something together. So it's, it's a pattern which has derived from, I think, a very high level of trust uh, of working together which goes back many, many decades and which has evolved through a series of very real projects uh, and which is going from strength to strength. Let me say something that to shock everybody here, but uh, on this very point about uh, Trident replacement, you need to replace Tridents, we need to replace Tridents. You want, uh, your people want a submarine with only 12 tubes, we want a submarine with 16 tubes. Why don't you build 16 and we'll rent four of them from you? I mean, I don't see any reason not to. We'll put a U.S. launch control officer on them. I can't imagine we're ever going to be in a war with gets to that level working, but uh, there's no reason we couldn't be thinking about that. We've got such intimate trust with each other. Let me... I better not try and answer that Don't question. answer I'll that question. Don't trouble. answer that question. Uh, you know? John, if I can say something about it, uh, I certainly agree with the comments about trust and confidence in the U.S. and Great Britain, but you know there's an element to our relationship and the element relationship with the Australia and frankly to Japan uh, where uh, it, uh, when you talk about federated defense, you tend to think about equipment and things of that nature. I think it starts with people, uh, both in the run-up to the Iraq War. We had uh, servicemen from uh, Great Britain, from Australia, and laterally from Japan, who were at CENTCOM involved in this, uh, at least understanding what was going on in the Department of State. We had officers from Great Britain, from Australia, from Japan, sitting right alongside with us. And you talk about something that really raises trust and confidence, uh, that does. So all of these things, federated events, starts, yeah. in my view, with the people. I hope we've solved the problem where we invite a foreign officer into our command center. He or she will write a memo that goes into our classified system, and then it's listed as no foreign, and they can't read it ever again the rest of their life. Yeah. I mean, we've had that goofy thing happen to us. I hope we can fix that at some point. Let's get to this issue you brought up, Rich, which I think is really quite interesting. Is that is. To what degree is this opportunity one to encourage collaboration among regional countries and partners that, that doesn't involve us, but we can be, play a role in helping to encourage that? You mentioned what the Nordic states were looking at. Uh, why don't you just expand on this, and then I'll turn to Ambassador. Well, the, the Nordics have a need for air defense. Uh, 
Uh, we're involved with some of those countries in terms of defense uh, commitments in NATO to the extent they're better able to provide for themselves. It's better for us. If we have the type of relationship that we uh, hope and sometimes we say we have with different countries, we can get a shared picture, which uh, plays very well for us. We here in this hemisphere with NORAD have a bit of this. We have some experience with developing a regional uh, uh, approach. I think in Southeast Asia, you could have this. And I'm not saying that we're in the middle of it, although two of the Southeast Asian nations are our allies. Uh, but we can certainly be, be fostering uh, this type of, of commitment to each other. And I think that in itself is a good thing. It lowers the defense temperature, it lowers the security temperature, and that's very much in our interest. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just uh, build on that to say that I once had a rather scratchy conversation with, uh, with a Brit uh, in your government who... Impossible. Oh, no, no. It was, it, and he was really going on and on about how impossible the Europeans were to work with and we're your closest friend. And I said, sir, with all due respect, what we most value in you as a partner is your ability to bring Europe along, not to be on our side of the agenda. Can you, this is, this is a difficult place that you have to walk, because I know that, that the UK has treasured its partnership with us, and yet it also has been an active leader in the European community. Can you help us think through how we could manage this in a better way? I, I'll try, uh, a couple of points. One is, this of course goes way beyond the defense relationship. Yes, it does, yes. It and does. this is uh, an issue which is out there as uh, the people of the United Kingdom, perhaps, uh, determine once and for all after the next general election, which will take place in May 2015, whether they wish to remain members of the European Union or not. Um, there are people in the UK who believe that uh, Britain should leave the European Union and go off into some wonderful, s sublime, uh, mid-Atlantic status as a 51st state of the Union, and that you would welcome us um, and, and uh, adapt <laughs> Uh, your operations, defense, political institutions, so on, to this wonderful new state of uh, Nirvana. Uh, there are others amongst us who don't think this is necessarily realistic and indeed remind those who think that the UK uh, can disappear off into the middle of the ocean by reminding them that the United States government position, which has been pretty constant for quite a while, is that the United States' interest remains in having a strong United Kingdom at the heart of a strong, outward-looking European Union. Uh, that is uh, kind of my point of departure. So I think um, we are very conscious, or those of us who, who, who work on these uh, subjects are very conscious that uh, uh, that is the UK, that is the US, if you like, strategic requirement. I think that's the best place for the United Kingdom to be. But uh, as you know, the Prime Minister has set out a program for improving the terms of membership and then seeking fresh consent, should he be given a majority uh, in the next general election in the UK, to uh, consult the British people to get fresh consent, if you like, for the concept of membership. So this whole issue of where the United Kingdom fits uh, its membership of Europe, its future as part of Europe, uh, and its uh, relationship with the United States is quite complex and is, is quite political in this sense. Um, back to the defense, second point really, just to say that uh, I think we are very conscious of the importance of engaging with our European partners in order to make uh, the alliance, the relationship across the Atlantic much more effective, more inter interoperable, uh, more cost effective, mm -hmm. because we're very conscious, I hear it regularly from very senior members of the administration, that there is a uh, growing level of concern in the administration and on Capitol Hill that the United States is today shouldering something in the region of 73, 75% of the cost of NATO, and that some Europeans are not doing their share of sharing the burden. Uh, we are currently at 2.4% of GDP on defense expenditure, so we're comfortably in excess of the 2% commitment. Some are not even at 2%. Uh, we know that we've got to work, therefore, with our European partners. And one way we've got to do this uh, is to try to improve the way in which we do get smart with the capabilities that we have got so that what we do is more effective. We're doing it already, as I was just trying to say, with the United States. We're doing it uh, more and more with the French, but we need to do it uh, as Europeans uh, more effectively as well. And I think that's where we can perhaps play a role in, in bringing along the European members of the alliance mm -hmm. in order to make it work better and more cost effectively. The last thing I would add is that 
it needs to go beyond the European members of the alliance. And, and we think of the NATO partnerships which have been developed. And there's a whole bunch of them. There's the Istanbul Security Initiative. There's the, the, another one with the Gulfies. There's, you know, there are a series of different things which have been going, most of us don't even know this, for 10, 15 years. And are one reason why, for example, in Libya, when some European members of NATO declined to take part, it was not that difficult to bring in some of our Middle East partners who actually took part with pilots and aircraft and so on in taking military operations within the framework of an existing and tried and tested NATO command structure. So I think it, it isn't just about uh, the existing members of NATO, some of whom will show up on the day and some of whom may not. It's also about using that to develop broader partnerships uh, of a basis which is sometimes ad hoc, uh, fresh coalitions, uh, and which will be different in accordance with what the task is and where the theater is in which we've got to act. That's really interesting. Rich, you... I was just thinking as the ambassador spoke that uh, uh, I had started out, ambassador, before you arrived, uh, talking a little bit about the rebalancing. And one of the things that we forgot to do when we announced the rebalance to Asia was to say what it was and what it wasn't. And it wasn't, of course, turning our back on, on Europe. It wasn't meant to be, and uh, I think the administration is correct the, the record, but it, it also wasn't meant to be a free ride. And I acknowledge Great Britain is, is, is doing the job at 2.4. France is above the 2%, but most, as you suggest, are, are well below, well below. Even Australia is at 1.7%. So the, the rebalance to Asia was not a lot of things, but it was certainly not a free ride. And your comments about that remind me. And if you can bring along our European friends, you've done the Lord's work. You know, the, you mentioned the Libya operation. Very interesting. We haven't studied this uh, yet enough. Uh, but this was, was one instance where Europe chose to lead a military operation within NATO with America playing more of a supporting role. And the, the Question first to you, Ambassador, is how you feel that's now being viewed uh, inside Europe. And then, Rich, do you think this is a model that Americans could accept as being more of a standard model inside, uh, kind of a, a new dimension for NATO? I would say that at the European level, I don't think anybody had any problem with that. In fact, many Europeans were probably comfortable with the fact that the United States uh, chose to be uh, less visibly up front. And those Europeans who uh, tell themselves or tell others that it was just us uh, with our, uh, our Arab friends who, who did the business in Libya uh, are deluding themselves. There was actually a very important US military commitment, uh, even if it was not a US-led campaign. Mm -hmm. And I totally understand, sympathize with the reasons why after Iraq, after Afghanistan, after a whole bunch of things going on in the region, the United States wasn't necessarily that keen to be up there waving the stars and strikes, leading the vanguard, and inviting everybody else to follow. But it was also, as so often happens on these occasions, one of those campaigns which developed extremely rapidly, almost with a kind of momentum of its own. Uh, I recall on the Monday evening, uh, the G8 foreign ministers couldn't even agree amongst the European members of it that anything should be done about Libya. Um, when on Wednesday, the United States circulated a new draft Security Council resolution, some people looked at it and thought, well, this has got no chance of passing, might even be a provocation. By Saturday lunchtime, we were in the Elysee Palace, and there was President Sarkozy telling the rest of the alliance, my planes are in the air, and you guys win with me. You know, it happened as rapidly as that. And there wasn't a huge amount of time to work out you know, who, was, who was up front, who was behind the rest of it. Uh, but I think that the way it came out, there was a very strong, very visible French and British uh, political commitment to get on with this campaign, but a very, very strong and, and I would say indispensable US military participation uh, with a number of others who, who came along and, and joined in. I think it worked extremely effectively. I would add one other little comment, straying slightly from, from that theme, but based on the Libya experience, uh, there were some very important lessons learned about equipment. Uh, in the course of that campaign. Uh, and I think that one of the corollaries of this degree of partnership, of this um, increased collaboration between members of the Alliance, has to be a greater readiness to um, uh, regard the procurement and the acquisition and the equipment program as a two-way street. Mm -hmm. and for example, we found that there was a, a piece of equipment which was originally developed as a tank buster called Brimstone, which is a missile manufactured in Britain but with a very high level of US content 
which was unbelievably accurate and uh, very, very effective there, and which we are, at the moment, demonstrating, I've just been to the test firing just the other day uh, at China Lake in California, is something which probably does also meet the requirements of the US military, and maybe with other allies. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, to the extent that we are very happy to buy rivet joint C-17 and Chinook helicopters and a bunch of other equipment, uh, the sustainability of defense spending does require uh, a visible two-way street in the defense procurement programs mm -hmm. of all of the allies. We've all got to be ready to buy what's the right kit at the right price from our partners and to be a little bit less sometimes kind of, well, that's mine and, and nationalistic in terms of the acquisition programs. And I think that needs to be over a period of time part of the deal. It does. Uh, I happen to agree with that. That's going to be a hard part of the deal. Though. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, uh, if I might to that, there's one other element that we learned that's something very important that we learned in the Libyan experience. And that is we can have the aircraft with a the bunker busters or whatever, if you don't have the pilots, and we had a shortage of pilots uh, at the, in, during the Libyan situation. So there's a lot of lessons out of it. The question you asked me, John, uh, <clears throat> is this a model for, as we go forward? I, I don't think so. I think what, what Libya was, was uh, showing and demonstrating, I think, was the American people and their, loath, their loathing of military involvement right now is just out of their experience of these two unpopular wars. And they've had enough, and so they were very content to let our president, quote, lead from behind. Uh, I've never understood the phrase, by the way, when you're a company commander or a platoon commander, you lead from the front. But when you're a general officer, uh, your place is probably not at the front leading a platoon or a company. It's probably back uh, where you can gain the greatest idea of the picture of the battlefield. So leading from behind is what we teach all of our general officers, division commanders. So they have got to be at the point of decision. Mm -hmm. Is it a model for going forward? Not sure. At least Americans, uh, if you think about it in a way, are awfully bloody minded. We don't think of ourselves this way. But we were in Afghanistan so many years after we initially invaded. We were in Iraq for so long, Vietnam, uh, another thing. So we can, we can put up with a level of pain. We're awfully bloody minded when we put our mind to it. But I think we need a little respite. So and immediately going forward is probably closer to a model. Syria comes to mind. But in the longer run, I think that uh, the United States, because we have equities and we have interest in almost every part of the globe, uh, is going to have to be more forward-leaning and more in the driver's seat. Well, I, I, I agree with that. But I, I'd, I'd also say, I mean, right now our French allies are carrying overwhelmingly the load in trying to bring security in the Sahara. They need our help. I mean, frankly, this is, a, this, is, this is in our interest for them to succeed, and we need to be doing more. It seems to me countries that have more expertise and background and experience, if they want to work inside a NATO framework, that, that, that merits some of our support, I think. No, in, in, indeed it, it does, but there's another side to that coin. If you look at some of the African countries, we have a surprising amount of U.S. forces there. Uh, they're prosecuting al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. And, I don't think it's very publicized. Uh, AFRICOM doesn't talk about it very much. But uh, So uh, you're completely right. The French are carrying a hell of a load in CAR and other places. Uh, we're transporting them on occasion, uh, probably asking them to pay for it as well. But, uh, if I know our comptrollers. Uh, <laughs> I was one I, of them once. I, you know, I, as you said, Judas Iscariot's the patron saint of all comptrollers. But, yeah. but I think what the French are doing where they're taking the lead, first of all in Mali and then subsequently in the CAR, it does bear out your point because what the French discovered very quickly was that to do that sort of operation on their own was becoming, uh, if not difficult, then pretty much impossible. Uh, and so therefore they came to you, they came to us, you know, we're providing C-17 heavy lift mm -hmm. to take their troops mm -hmm. to the CAR, you're providing transport, you're providing ISTAR, you're providing a bunch of different uh, uh, operational capabilities which increasingly we're going to find that members of the alliance don't have on their own. Hence the concept of the smart alliance where we all focus on what we're good at uh, and providing capability which others can draw on because very, very few, with the exception of the United States, occasionally ourselves, um, can do all this stuff entirely on our own. Mm -hmm. and the last mm -hmm. operation where the Brits were entirely autonomous and carried out a military campaign at very short notice was probably Sierra Leone. It actually worked very well, very effectively, but it didn't last more than about eight weeks. Uh, go, back to the, go back to the Falklands War, which was 12,000 miles from home. Uh, 
how easy would it be for us to repeat that operation if we had to today? I'm not going to answer the question. Well, it wouldn't be easy. <laughs> so we, no. you know, more and more, I think we, we do need to help each other out, even when yeah. one particular country is taking the lead, as the French have admirably, in my view, in Mali and the CAR. Well, it strikes me that it ought to become more than just kind of helping out, but actually become part of our strategy. Because, it, it, because it, it, going forward, we just don't have the depth or necessarily the expertise. John, that's, that's right. But if, if I may, I want to inject a slightly different note in this discussion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're talking in the main about allies. But when we talk about feder federated defense, I don't think we necessarily have to talk about allies only. Look at Singapore, for instance, which the stationing of the LCSs, uh, the F-16 deployments have been quite helpful uh, to us in, in, in our defense strategy and yet are not allies. So when we think about federated defense, I think we need to think of I agree. It, no, more I than can, just I, allies. I think, that, I think that's exactly right. Uh, Ambassador, do, do you feel that the defense budget now for UK is stabilized or do you feel it's, what, what can, what, uh, what's your sense of where it's heading over the next years? I would say that on the back of the 2010 strategic defense review that we conducted, we are, and the result of which was a plan to produce what we call Future Force 2020. You know, what do we need in 2020? And how do we get there? And what are the decisions we need to take? Some of them painful about cutting programs which were either very expensive or becoming obsolete, some of which were not actually obsolete but were very effective, in order to free up the resource to give us what we're going to need in the future. I think we've taken some pretty brave decisions. Uh, we've also done something which is probably a first in the last 40, 50 years. We balance the books. So our defense budget has not got a great big black hole and all sorts of unfunded future programs. The thing actually now makes sense financially, which is, it's been painful, but it does at least mean that there is a solid base on which to make future decisions as and when uh, resources are there or the needs arise. But we're going to be spending $250 billion over the next 10 years in re-equipping, updating, and replacing equipment. That's not small beer for us. Uh, we're going to have these two aircraft carriers. We're buying aircraft. We're, we're maintaining and going to update when the need uh, arises uh, the continuous at sea nuclear deterrent because there is uh, the decision is pretty much taken in the UK mm -hmm. that that is the only uh, that is the most cost effective way mm -hmm. of uh, continuing to play our part there. Uh, we're going to have um, the carrier strikers I was talking about. We're going to have long range uh, capabilities with uh, aircraft in order to deliver troops abroad, we will be able to uh, mount at very short notice and sustain indefinitely at least a brigade size operation. And with a bit more early warning and a bit more time, we can do something bigger than that uh, for um, a long period of time as well. So we're feeling that given the constraints, uh, fiscal primarily, uh, we're in much better shape than we were. We'll be no doubt looking again at what we need and, and what the prices are and, and which direction to go on in the years to come because the requirements and the technology uh, and the interoperability and what to do with our partners are evolving all the time, as are the threats and, and, and our calculation of where we need to be and what kit we're going to need in the years to come. But we're feeling that we're in much better shape than we were just a few mm -hmm. years ago. Let me, we're coming to the hour, and I promised Rich I'd let him get out of here by 6. But I, let me pose kind of the last question. And, and, and let me start by saying at, uh, at, the, at the outset, uh, it's very much in America's interests for the United Kingdom to remain a leading country in Europe. I mean, I think that's overwhelmingly in our interest. So I, I use that as the introduction for this for this question. And Ambassador, you raised the question of smart defense, which is kind of people doing what they do well now or be prepared to commit to do something that they can do well. But is there a blueprint for this? I keep asking my European friends, what's the blueprint for a smart defense so that when we're done with this, we don't have 26 semi-controlled crash landings where everybody's cut their budget, and instead what comes out of it is a coherent whole, but I don't see the blueprint. Can the United Kingdom play a role in getting us a blueprint for Europe? Not us, US, but Europe, a blueprint for its smart defense. Uh, two comments. Uh, first of all, for the first time in five years, later this week, heads of government of the European Union are going to get together to look at precisely these questions of security. Um, and uh, that is, I think, going to focus minds, and we may have some better answers to your question after that. The second thing I would say is that um, uh, we're certainly ready to try doing that, but I would just uh, flag a word of caution, uh, something which you have dealt with for many years, which is in the UK, 
there is a sensitivity on the issue of sovereignty and sovereign mm -hmm. control mm -hmm. over our defense capability. It's one thing to have a, a very high degree of interoperability, uh, cooperation, joint task forces, joint projects with uh, very close allies, particularly the United States, but uh, with one or two other partners as well. It is quite another for us to somehow see uh, national security being subsumed into uh, the concept of European Union integration, which some member states uh, hold dearer than we do. So uh, while we're very happy to see, we want to see the European partners of the alliance uh, uh, carry more of the water, and we want to see more European smart defense, and we want to see uh, within NATO the Europeans uh, playing their part and working more closely together, what we're uh, concerned about on our side would be anything which amounted to a pooling of sovereignty in the concept of defense within the European Union. That is, that's kind of no-go territory for, for the Brits, um, but it is quite separate from wanting Europe to play its part within the alliance, within the existing command and other structures uh, of NATO, and to working with our European partners to try to divvy up, if I can put it like that, uh, the individual responsibilities that each of the European partners of the alliance should be assuming uh, in a more major function as part of making the alliance work better uh, and as part of the whole operation being, being smarter and more fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. Rich, your views on this, and then we'll, yeah. I'll let you each wrap up here. Well, <clears throat> I was thinking about Asia when you were asking this, John. Um, the ambassador touches on the key element of federated defense that no one wants to, although we're all Westphalian nation states of the 21st century, we all understand that we have to cede some sovereignty uh, for the general public good, the global good, the sovereignty of the commitment of our forces in the combat is one that no nation is going to give up. And that's the real difficult part, it seems to me, of talking about uh, federated defense. Uh, it'd be part of this, I look at the U.S.-Japan relationship in this context and see that uh, you've got part of the elements of everything I think you'd want in federated defense, except one you mentioned at the opening, and that is uh, getting away from larger U.S.-style bases and turning into more Misawa-type joint uh, bases where the Japanese flag is primary and the U.S. flag is secondary, and we're clearly guests, the wanted guests. Um, so I, th I think if, if at least you talk about federated defense, you look to Asia, you ought to look closely at the U.S.-Japan relations. It's got element of, of uh, procurement, uh, which helped both of us because uh, of the economy of scale. Uh, it's got element of presence, which we're allowed to use a presence, which serves Japan's interest as well as our own. Uh, it's got uh, all the elements I think you'd want, training together, working together. Uh, et cetera. So I think that, that and along with Australia is probably the key when you look at Asia to uh, what we're talking about in federated defense in the area. In the, with the rest of the countries, there are elements of it, but because I think of the historic neuralgia uh, that exists uh, and fresh neuralgia, it's hard for me to see that they would move together very far, very quickly. So having said that, the historic neuralgia in Europe uh, over the past couple hundred years is pretty enormous, and Europe has, for the most part, gotten past it. Well, clearly with, with Europe, because of the structure that NATO provided, there is an international framework of interoperability that's a huge starting point. We don't have that in Asia. But because of such strong and intimate connections with Japan and Korea and Australia and others, we can build them out. And having them extend their networks similarly, we can build a de facto interoperability. That would be but, very Well, helpful. you have got, John, with the ASEAN Defense Minister's Ministerial, uh, sort of a framework. I'm going to talk, it's yes. not NATO-like, but right. it does provide uh, the venue to have just these discussions. Yep. Uh, and they're off the record venues, very often, or sometimes yeah, not with the communique or anything. So. Uh, therefore, the best of all discussions. Well, this was exactly the way I wanted to launch this. I mean, it, you can see there's an, there's an enormous amount of intellectual depth, but, uh, but uncertainty inside this idea. I'm convinced it's where we have to go, but we have so much engineering details, you know, to, to be able to get through. It was a perfect way to launch it. We're going to turn to my colleagues here now. We're going to amplify on it. Would you all, with your applause, say thank you to Ambassador Westerkopf and Ambassador Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, nice, to nice to see you. you. You're a good friend of Martin Rosen. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, I am. We're going to do a little bit of a set change, uh, I think, as we get the seating set up for our panelists. Um, so during that time, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the study effort. Uh, first of all, I'm Kathleen Hicks. I'm the director of the International Security Program here at CSIS, and I'm, I will be leading the cross-CSIS effort on federated defense. Um, there is a website now up on CSIS. You'll see the address is over here, which is csis.org slash FDP. Thank you. Um, and on there you will see, uh, obviously after today, the webcast of this event. You will have a concept paper that overviews the project um, and some links to our experts, some of whom will be here today, and you all are welcome to start moving up. Um, to, uh, to speak to uh, the federated defense topic. So first of all, what do we mean by federated defense? Um, I think you had a very good overview today from the opening panel and particularly from Dr. Hamry's concluding remarks, which are that we have the genesis of a, an idea here, the seeds of an idea, but a lot of engineering detail to work out. Our conception is, again, that it's a major effort that brings together thoughts on defense industry, on international trade, regional expertise. In this case today, we're going to be talking mostly about Middle East and Asia, um, and understanding of the US defense system and strategy. It really is intended to be a geostrategic approach. For many years across multiple administrations, you've heard discussion of building partnership capacity, very good term that served us well, but it has its limits. And as Dr. Hamry started to indicate, and, and uh, Dr. Armitage as well, we're really moving from describing the action, building partnership um, capacity, to describing the goal we're trying to achieve. It's really a geostrategic concept of achieving federated defense. Um, it's also a little less paternalistic, by the way, than building partnership capacity. This is really about working on an even playing field with allies and partners around the globe on particular security interests that are common to us all. There are, for 2014, three major study areas that we will be focusing on. And again, this is laid out in our concept paper. The first is understanding the global defense supply chain. Uh, which is foundational to everything that we are doing, and we will, Scott and I will talk about that today. Uh, we will be also focusing on defense industrial cooperation, building off of our understanding of that global supply chain. What are the barriers to further uh, defense cooperation around the world, especially coming from the United States and our system? And then third, we will focus on Asia, a federated defense approach for Asia. That includes defining the goals of what such an architecture would bring, what differences we might have with our partners and allies in terms of goals, and then trying to define those areas of common interest where we can begin to knit together patterns of cooperation that can build into a stronger defense approach. And it will end with those requirements and capabilities we think we need. We will also be starting later in 2014 our work on um, a federated defense approach for the Middle East, and so we're going to talk about that today. So with that, I'm going to move up here and introduce our panelists. Thanks very much. So let me start all the way um, to my right, and we have here Scott Miller, who is our Shoal Chair in um, International Business from 1997 to 2012. Mr. Miller was Director of Strategic, uh, excuse me, Global Trade Policy at Procter & Gamble. Um, to his uh, immediate left, we have John Alterman, who holds the Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy, and he's the Director of the Middle East Program here at CSIS. Prior to joining CSIS in 2002, John served on the Policy Planning Staff at State and as a Special Assistant to the Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Eastern Affairs. Excuse me. Over here we have Mike Green, he's the Senior Vice President for Asia and Japan Chair. He's also an Associate Professor at the Walsh School for Foreign Service at Georgetown. And he served on the NSC, when we called it the NSC, from 2001 through 2005. And then all the way to my left is David Berteau, who's the CSIS Senior Vice President and Director of National Security Program and Industry and Resources, which focuses on defense industry, government procurement, and national security programs and contracts as well as current and future constraints on budgets and resources. So with that um, wide perspective that we're bringing to you today, we're going to walk through some of the major concepts behind federated defense and then open it up for questions and answers uh, from the audience. Questions from the audience, hopefully answers from us. 
So let me start over um, to my right with Scott. Uh, really foundational to understanding how we do a federated defense is understanding how that global defense supply chain works and functions. What are the key considerations we should be taking into account as we look at the supply chain? Thank you. Uh, let me start with two observations. The first is that at a time of significant defense spending cuts, both here at home and among our major allies, that uh, we stand to gain a lot from integrating defense markets as part of any federated de defense. So I'll address specifically the issue of defense markets. The second observation is that uh, defense procurement and the defense industrial base looks a lot different than most procurement bases and most industrial bases in the United States. And I think that's because of uh, a number of factors. First, the defense industrial procurement and, and purchasing is still very national. In 2009, the Pentagon spent 98% of its dollars with U.S. firms. That's, that number is replicated in other markets. Interestingly, I uh, found that uh, Germany, uh, Italy, and France all spent about 98% of their budgets on domestic suppliers after the European Union issued a directive to try to get intra-European purchases. So th there, there's something going on here uh, that, that's important and very different than the way operations go outside of the defense industry. But more importantly, uh, U.S. firms in the defense industry are still largely uh, vertically integrated and comprehensive you know, firms. And what's been happening for the past 25 years, really based on changes in technology, information and communication technology, transport technology, and the push toward greater specialization, is that, that most firms outside the defense industry and it's over a long period of time, very gradually, but have become massively uh, more specialized <laughs> in the tasks that they do, uh, vertically disintegrated versus their past history, uh, and uh, operating with supply networks in a way, and this is not just having suppliers, it is deep coordination and deep information sharing and production sharing with suppliers. It's often called trading tasks. It's often characterized as the rise of global value chains. But what, what's really going on is there's been a, a, a revolution in the way production happens, and production is highly dispersed in most products. Uh, the, some of the more obvious ones are, for instance, Apple Corporation. Apple Corporation actually owns no manufacturing plants. It's a, it, it designs products, it markets them brilliantly, but it makes nothing in terms of Apple Corporation itself. Now, that's not unusual and it's becoming, it's, it's a, actually if you look at the market capitalization and the success of Apple as a corporation, it's a model to be uh, admired and aspired to. Uh, at the same time as while, while production is being dispersed, more importantly, knowledge is dispersed. And, and as I look at the, the, uh, uh, the defense industry versus non-defense, it is the ability to contain knowledge is almost impossible in a world of information communication technology. Knowledge becomes dispersed. Experts, people with know-how, people with operational and uh, uh, basic research and development know-how are outside your networks and that, that, that adds complication and over time adds problems. So in the near term, uh, the defense industrial base has an opportunity for, uh, for improvement uh, in cost in the long term, the problem is really a knowledge problem. As uh, I've talked with some of my colleagues, uh, the basic issue is a re regulatory structure that reflects uh, a different era, perhaps the Cold War, but also reflects a different kind of industrial organization than what is more common today and what, is, what, what provides the opportunity for efficiencies, but also uh, solutions to the problem of knowledge. That's, that's a great background, and David, going from there into the world of industrial cooperation and defense, what are your major takeaways in terms of how you're going to connect this understanding of the global supply chain to some of the barriers that countries often complain to U.S. officials about in terms of dealing with our system? Thanks, Kath, and, and thanks, Scott, for that, that overview. I'm struck by a comment that Ambassador Armitage made uh, early on in the conversation before that uh, it would be useful for us to start with something non-threatening. 
I, I wish I could say that, in fact, supply chain is non-threatening. But having spent a, a lifetime working with the uh, defense uh, industrial base and the dedication of that industrial base to sustaining itself, it, it may not be non perceived as non-threatening across the board. Nonetheless, I think it does offer a tremendous opportunity in terms of looking at federated capability, not only in Asia, but, but in Europe as well. Um, you know, you can go from 98% to 97% and you will have increased the non-controlled part by 50%. And so, you know, you can, you can have a fairly modest uh, uh, change here and a pretty dramatic initial effect. Um, I think there's three areas that we want to look at here. One is, in fact, the, the ability to bring into the defense universe um, the benefits of, of what's happened, the revolution in global supply chain. Uh, we've looked at this pretty thoroughly over the last couple of years and have discovered uh, something that won't surprise uh, many people in this room. One is that government-to-government -government, uh, joint successes are fairly rare. Um, far more common is, in fact, an industry-to-industry -industry partnership. And, and I think if we look at building industry-to-industry -industry partnerships as a gateway to government-to-government -government collaboration and cooperation, we'll find some opportunities for near-term success at fairly small scale, but again, given from the, uh, the, the base that we're starting from, they'll be quite significant, if you will. And they would create some of that start at the non-threatening level. The second is the, the U.S. barriers, if you will, and we're all very familiar with those. Everything from uh, the processes by which we uh, uh, issue licenses for exports, the processes by which we sell U.S. Uh, goods and, and services through, uh, through foreign military uh, assistance and security assistance programs. But, but we don't want this to be about process change, in, in effect, because we've wrestled with that time and time again. What we really want to do is to identify some areas where, in fact, near-term collaboration and cooperation can occur, and to use those as a basis for building on. And the third is to look at it from the outcomes point of view, because ultimately it's not about whether or not we can increase a dollar level at, at, uh, at, at, but whether or not we end up with greater capability at the back end of it, if you will. So I think that's the three areas that we're going to look at over the next few months. You really echoed, I think, um, what Ambassador Armitage was saying in terms of the um, export control. He used that example of the export control world and, and understanding how to break through that. So I just want to press that point a little bit to ask, you know, are, are, is it worth the effort to look at some of the processes that we have, whether it's export control or others. Even though we don't want a process reform study per se, there are clearly areas of frustration for partners with the United States. How do you plan to look at those? I think what we, what we do need to look, in fact, at integration across the, the processes, if you will. There have been a number of studies in recent months and years, both in DOD and across the federal government, of opportunities to, uh, to do this. I think it's implementing the existing work that's been done would be our initial focus. Uh, DOD alone last year had three separate uh, studies, and, and in fact, uh, they're in various stages of implementation. I think tying those together would be the most useful first step. Great. Mike, let me turn to you. Um, Ambassador Armitage spoke quite a bit already about Asia and the, at the application of federated defense there. I'm wondering if you can help us think through how our partners and allies would look at an approach like federated defense. Would it be seen as a, a welcome new breakthrough? Would it be seen as yet another um, indication that the U.S. doesn't have the wherewithal to underwrite its commitments and its shifting burden? How do you think it would be perceived to include by uh, China and others in the region who, who may not welcome a strong U.S. presence? Well, we have to be, um, I think the short answer is in general, our allies will look on it favorably and, uh, and the Chinese won't like it very much. <laughs> um, that's a fairly safe prediction. We, we should be um, sensitive to historical precedent. And the one that, um, as an academic, uh, uh, always occurs to me is the so-called Guam Doctrine or Nixon Doctrine. So in 1969, Richard Nixon in the summer said, we're going to get our Asian allies to, to carry more of the burden. And the, the doctrine or the concept had two elements. One was, you Asian allies do more. And the second part was, we have a balance of payments problems, so you buy more from us. So it was overwhelmingly about shifting the burden. And the um, result was that our alliances sort of drifted through the 70s. Um, what was missing was um, thinking about um, how not you Asian allies do more, but how do we operate more effectively together? How do we become more joint or virtually joint, more interoperable? And that was not there in the Guam Doctrine. And the second part was instead of buy more from us to correct our you know, balance of payment problems, how do we, with pressure on our defense budgets, do things more effectively for our taxpayers together? So I think if we have that in mind and we approach this as a, a, a comprehensive win-win approach, it will go well. 
Um, David and I co-led uh, for, for, for you, I guess, when you were in the Pentagon, this uh, independent review of our rebalance strategy to Asia. <clears throat> um, and one of the things that uh, struck us was um, we couldn't find um, really anywhere in the U.S. government um, somebody who was uh, authorized to think about um, shape um, our joint requirements with our friends, allies, and partners. Um, wasn't really PACOM, wasn't really OSD. <clears throat> um, the U.S.-Korea alliance, because it's joint and combined, was an exception to this rule, but even with Australia. Um, there just wasn't a, um, a, a cohesive campaign plan across government to think about what requirements we should develop, capabilities we should develop between ourselves and our allies. We have this in NATO, though imperfect. We don't have it in Asia outside, really, of the U.S.-Korea alliance, because we have uh, wartime op con transition and so forth. So as I look at how the Asia group and all of us will work on this in Asia, I think we need to think through how would you first and foremost organize the U.S. government so that we could begin thinking um, further down the road, not service to service or you know, uh, command to command, um, but in a strategic way, the capabilities, the requirements we have, the capabilities we need. Um, and it, it will be concentric circles. There will be high-end deterrence things we need for North Korea. There will be basic capacity building, maritime domain awareness that our Philippine or Vietnamese or other friends may want. Some of this we may do, some of this the Japanese or the Koreans or the Australians may do. Uh, and the concentric circle grows because, uh, Rich mentioned the ADMM plus, the new defense ministerial process. Well, that includes China, includes India. Um, so there will be some things that are not deterrence and dissuasion that are basically um, response to humanitarian and other crises, which is a matter of importance to us because we don't want failed, failing, vulnerable states. So it's kind of concentric circles. Mm -hmm. um, it will require a strategic um, concept um, and leadership and agility, which we generally don't demonstrate, but that's why we're doing this, <laughs> to, to try to think of um, how would we uh, try to get closer to that. Very good. Well, John, in the Middle East and uh, the United States has extensive experience in um, working with uh, partners on transferring weapons, sa selling weapons, um, Egypt, Israel, uh, the Gulf. Are there, for looking forward on Federated Defense for the Middle East, are there lessons we should be thinking about based on those experiences? Or, and more generally, how might the Middle East um, be a, a place where the concept of federated defense can work. Yeah, well, I, I, thank you very much. I, I think there are three sort of baskets of issues we have to consider when we're thinking about applying this concept to the Middle East, which, as far as I can tell, is going to be a continued source of instability or fear of instability for many years to come. And, and one of the questions that we have to start with is what is the source of that Instability is it likely to come from states? Is it likely to come from non-state actors? And what kinds of capabilities do you have to build a defense to? That's the overarching question. Within that, I think you have three sets of questions. One is, what do you do about the fact that the nature of some of your relationships and some of your partners may change over the period of implementation? We are dealing with the fact that our relationship with the military in Egypt is in a state of flux right now. So if you're starting to invest in capabilities, you're starting to invest in allies taking over capabilities, one of the things you have to hedge against is the nature of those relationships may change during your process of implementation. That's problem one. Problem two is you're talking about tweaking a relationship with the Gulf that from the perspective of most of the states of the Gulf has worked pretty well. And that relationship has been, we put, we, the Gulf, put tens of billions of dollars into buying your weapon systems, and you provide strategic depth for the Gulf. If you're going to change that, does that mean they have to buy less? Does that mean that these countries, many of which only have a million citizens, have to put up more? What if they think we are strategically misguided in our policy, which is, what you're hearing from a lot of them about Iran. Are they committed to following us down the wrong path on Iran? Can they have more voice in the policy if there's going to be more responsibility? So I think there are a number of questions in the Gulf that if maybe the Gulf already represents what we're looking for. And if it doesn't, 
there is going to be a transition period to get them to the point where we want them to be and where they want us to be. The third is in many ways for the most complex, which is what do we do with our Israel relationship in this concept? Because on the one hand, we have been unwilling to rely on Israeli capabilities to do the security things we want to do in the Middle East. When we have a war with Iraq, Israel doesn't play a role. In fact, we send uh, Deputy Secretary Eagleburg there, there during the Gulf War to babysit the Israelis to make sure they don't have a role. <clears throat> and on the other hand, you have our relationship with Israel and the assurance that Israel has a qualitative military edge over all of its neighbors, therefore putting a wet blanket over what you're willing to sell to the rest of the region. And this Israeli role, where they are not being leveraged, but they are providing a ceiling over the kinds of relationships you have with others, I think being a problem that we're going to have to, to unknot if we're going to really be serious about this in the Middle East. So the most interesting part of your project is going to be in late 2014, we delve into the Middle East issues. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. No. <laughs> uh, well, actually, I think uh, the following point I was going to have for both of you, and maybe this will show some of the regional differences. As I said in my opening remarks, one of the issues with building partnership capacity is it's often a bit paternalistic and it's um, sort of the United States looking for areas we want others to grow in and trying to get their in investment in there. I think with a federated approach at its base level, you're looking for areas where the partner or the ally agrees they want to grow their capability. And it's, that's not actually an easy subset to come to. So the Gulf, uh, I reflect on the fact that many of the Gulf states are very interested in high end um, tactical aircraft, as an example, or precision guided munitions. Um, and we may want them to increase investment, for instance, in minesweepers. And they're probably equally important um, uh, examples in, in Asia. So my question is, how do we, as we develop this concept and think about the strategy for implementing it, how do we come to agreement? How do we find areas beyond humanitarian where we and our partners and allies can agree that we have a common goal and there's a, an obvious capability set to grow there that we all can convince our domestic publics to invest in. How's that for an easy I mean, question? I, look, I, th I think <clears throat> we have some real stumbling blocks in the region. One is that, that for many of these countries, they perceive a domestic threat, which we don't, or we don't perceive or we perceive differently than they do. Um, and coming to some understanding about what do they have to prepare for is a problem. And the second is the strategic issue that there's not unanimity that our approach to Iran is the right approach. And for many of them, they want to build up a greater deterrent to Iran. And we are having a rapprochement with Iran. By the way, they're having their own interesting relationship with Iran. I heard that a, a senior Gulf Royal, who I won't name, may be headed to Iran next month for his own discussion. So it's, it's a more complex relationship. And I think what it highlights is that we have to be more engaged in the strategic level of discussions and come to some greater understanding about what it is that we're trying to do and what the nature of security is um, than we have been willing to do in the last few years. The problem with that is there are a lot of areas where we just don't agree. Right. And they just look at us and say, you guys are naive and we understand the region and we've been here for thousands of years and you guys come in and aren't serious and there has to be a way that, that they feel that not only are their voices being heard but they're taken into consideration and for a lot of Americans with their own notion of how politics work and how the world should be, that may be either a hard pill to swallow or a pill people say we just won't swallow. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on well, the same issue? Well, the Middle East is hard, <laughs> but Asia is no picnic. Um, we in the United States very much, very much want interoperability uh, among our Korean, Japanese allies and ourselves. But right now, opinion polls that just came out in Japan show that over 70% of Japanese don't trust Koreans. We knew the Koreans were mad at the Japanese. Now it's going the other way. Boy. Um, so, yeah, uh, we um, have an interest in... Um, 
professionalizing the militaries in places like uh, Burma, Myanmar, uh, Indonesia. We have our own restrictions, especially now with the military in Myanmar. <coughs> um, so, it's, so we have our own difficulties engaging in places where we think there needs to be better capacity building. Um, some countries, uh, the Philippines, uh, Japan may not be so nervous about, um, in fact, may in fact want China to see us doing more, whereas a country like Korea, which is a solid ally, doesn't want the China problem, they want us to help them deter North Korea. So it's, the threat assessment is multi-directional, the historical baggage is complicated. We have our own historical baggage, and then we have this uh, larger problem that China's not a country we're trying to contain. <clears throat> um, we're trying to shape Chinese decision making, and uh, it's hard to get the balance right. I think there are some uh, Rich's point earlier about um, don't try to reform the whole export control system, but pick countries. I'd even say pick projects. Yeah. Uh, for example, Asia is a very large maritime theater. We, in our PACOM report, said the Marine Corps should have another amphibious radio group. Uh, well, actually, we're getting rid of an amphibious radio group, probably. So <clears throat> the Marines um, can't maneuver without uh, amphibious radio groups, but they can move things with high-speed vessels. Right. So Japan, Australia, and others, especially Australia, you know, the concept at one point, and we're straying from this and need to get back to it, is Australia could have that high-speed vessel capability so we could move Marines around, do amphibious exercises with all the allies and partners that want that capability themselves, Japan, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Korea, <coughs> um, and, 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 and think about eight, moving high-speed vessels more into a collaborative federated capability, mm -hmm. including for other countries that want amphibious capabilities, like Japan, uh, that want to get to Guam to do exercises and so forth. Um, missile defense. Uh, the Koreans, the Japanese, the Australians. The Japanese are our most significant missile defense partner in the world probably today, certainly in Asia. The Koreans are, um, they have a missile defense capability. They just don't like to call it that. Um, uh, we uh, learned with the North Korean missile launch uh, uh, recently that we are not so good at talking to each other. So that's an area. Submarines, uh, we don't make diesel subs. The Japanese make some of the best in the world. The Australians need Collins class submarines. We have an interest, a national security strategic interest in Australia having a fast, long leg submarine. The best propulsion in the world for diesel submarines is Japan. The Japanese are revising their defense export rules to actually allow collaboration, but they've not really done it. The Australians haven't done it with Japan. There's a role for us to help shape that, um, even though we, our nuclear navy will never let us build a diesel sub, but we can certainly help because we do the weapon systems for both countries. Um, so I think there are probably a dozen projects like that. Um, uh, a Global Hawk and UAVs for maritime domain awareness with the Philippines, a patrol craft where um, we can lead from behind, we can be the integrator, we can assist others, um, and that uh, if we have a plan for this, the Secretary of Defense, the PACOM commander, will know where to spend their chits because reforming our export control system overall is a Sisyphean task, but there may be specific projects where we can get work done and, and overcome some of these barriers. Right. Could I add a sure. little bit to that? Yeah, please go ahead. Or do you want to ask well, a question you, first? You can finish and then I'll ask a question okay. if you don't answer it with All your right. comment. That's fair. <laughs> um, I, I think that, that what Mike and John have laid out is a very good view from sort of the geostrategic level down and, and looking at it both from a force posture and a force shaping point of view. But there's a bottom up piece as well, the, the idea mm -hmm. of, of loosening the, uh, the three principles for, for Japanese. Uh, exports, if you will. Um, it might be easier to tackle that at the supply chain end, where you're right. looking at actually services and, and, uh, and, and sparing, for instance, spare parts, uh, rather than at the major end item or even at the, at the uh, diesel submarine propulsion system end. It may be easier to crack mm -hmm. the code, if you will, across the Asia-Pacific region. I think that's less valid as a, as a Middle East approach, simply because you don't have the indigenous in-house capability. They would love to have that. They may eventually get to that point, but I don't think they're there the same way, for instance, the Japanese Japanese companies would be able to move into the supply chain business from a national security perspective in a federated capability across the Asia Pacific in the trilateral and multilateral relations that you talked about. Well, so what I was going to ask next, uh, links to that and for, for both you and for Scott, and for you it's to say, well, you know, those roles, the various roles that, that Mike was pointing out the U.S. could play in a greater, et cetera, can you, have you, can you just expand on that kind of from the bottom up? perspective, and then maybe, Scott, if you have some examples from other sectors that we ought to be thinking about, we in the defense world ought to be thinking about um, as it relates to how we do that. 
Well, one of, the, one of the lessons that we learned from the last drawdown in the 1990s is the way that defense companies managed to survive a dramatic reduction in DOD expenditure in both procurement and research and development was, in fact, expanding their international business. Um, they all are, are looking at that as well. In fact, if you listen to the analyst calls uh, for each of the companies as they um, talk to Wall Street, uh, they're all expanding their business in internationally. If you add them all up, uh, the total is actually greater than will be reality. So clearly some are going to do better than others in that regard. Um, but I think it's actually in our national interest to find ways to encourage it and support that. Um, but to do so in a way that doesn't undermine the relations and the burgeoning relations with the, with the governments and, and the bilateral and multilateral relations that we're developing there. That's going to be pretty tricky. We don't actually have a cookbook with the recipe of how to do that. I think that's a lot of what we're going to have to look at over the next few months. Scott, anything we can learn from? Sure, from and it really comes down to what you measure. David talked about moving from uh, 98 to 97 percent uh, domestic uh, purchasing uh, as a one way to measure, and that, that is actually a typical way into organizations measure themselves. It's versus year ago, it's versus previous uh, plan, it's versus some internal measure. And the most important thing to take into account the knowledge problem associated with supply chains is to measure the outside world. Uh, my previous company was known as a leader in its, in its research and development. We spent about twice as much per dollar of net sales on R&D as any of our competitors. And yet we started, and so we thought we were fine, except we were being out innovated. And we started measuring outside. We had to ask a simple question. How many people in the world are doing our kind of research at our level? We knew how many people we had. But it took us a while to figure out how many people in the rest of the world were thinking about the same kinds of things, working on the same problems, and doing it at the same level, whether a basic or applied research. And we found out that given our, that our industry leading capability was 2% of all the researchers in the world. And at that point, we stopped everything and set a hairy audacious goal of having half our commercial innovation coming from outside the company within five years. And totally rethought our approach to R&D. So it, it really comes down to, uh, it's, a, it's an aphorism to, that you get what you measure. But what gets measured in the supply base uh, probably needs to change or needs to, we need to measure different things if we want a different result. Well, you as an audience have been extremely patient as we've talked at you for a while, so I think what I'd like to do is open it up for questions. And I'm going to apologize in advance because both my height and the way the chairs are arranged, if you are in the corners, I will not be able to see you. So if you'd like to ask a question, move, move more toward the center. And we do have mics that will come around. So just um, uh, once you're called upon, if you can um, give your name and affiliation. So questions. Right here. Thank you. My name is Jean Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I would like to ask all the panelists to talk also about India and uh, Russia and Central Asia. Uh, what is your vision for that part of the world? And in particular, the Southeast Asia with everything happening recently, the recent almost collisions between the U.S. and um, Chinese uh, vessels in that area, and also the AEDIZ with all of that. Is there anything that would um, have impact on your plan for the Federated Defense? Thank you. I can, I can start um, on um, just taking the three, India, Russia, and then the um, Central Asian. So we start backwards. On Central Asia, we're not starting there. What will be, our Asia look will be um, from the Indian Ocean over, but not as high up, uh, if you will, as um, uh, Central Asia. Um, for um, Russia, we have some separate work where we're looking at the global um, arms trade, uh, which is not part of this project, but is work CSIS is doing. But if there are areas for potential collaboration with the Russians as it relates to the regions we are looking at, we would certainly look at that as an opportunity. And again, that could occur in either of these regions and, of course, could occur in Europe. Um, and then finally, India. It is uh, our sense that India will be a part of our look at Asia. And let me just turn it over to Mike if you have any additional thoughts on, on how that might play in. Um, we, uh, CSIS did a report actually last year on U.S.-India defense um, industrial technology relations. 
in part because of the frustration I had India in my belly when I was in the NSC, uh, in part because of the frustration I think in industry and probably duty has felt about the U.S.-India defense relationship. Um, it has not lived up to the potential it seemed to have. It's going to be a long-term process with India. Now, U.S. companies are selling a lot of things, C-130s and so forth, um, frigates to the Indians, and uh, it's an important defense market. Um, but uh, uh, this is why we have to have kind of a case-by-case. -case. I would argue the most important thing from the U.S. interest standpoint with India is that India has the capacity to, in effect, sanitize the Indian Ocean for us. I mean, if the Indians can gain uh, more control over the Indian Ocean, um, that's in U.S. interests, and I, and, I, and I think there are capacity building opportunities there. And then we want to do as much as we can to build interoperability. We do a lot with the Indian Air Force, red flag up in Alaska. We do a lot with the Indian Navy. Uh, used to be a talking point, I don't know if it's still true, that the U.S. and India exercise more than India and the rest of the world. So, so that's a, something we want to keep building on. Um, and the Japanese in particular, but also Singapore and other countries are doing more with India uh, in, 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 the, in the areas of exercising, and uh, Japan actually has a security agreement with India. That's the kind of federated and network capabilities that um, overall uh, help to make the Asia-Pacific region more stable. Um, Central Asia is a bit different. I mean, you mentioned ADIS. The security problems that unify Japan to India, including you know, Taiwan, Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Australia, and almost everybody in between are, are maritime problems, they're sea lane problems, piracy, natural disasters. It's a set of problems that, that, that builds an opportunity for common, um, well, cl common doctrine or thinking about common capabilities. Central Asia is a bit different, I think, um, and would take more, more, more thought. But we don't have any... Um, yeah. Right. So just to clarify on the project overall, we're starting in these two regions, and then as the project progresses, we will take on additional regions, but no commitments right now on the order of those others. We, these are pretty um, significant uh, challenges to, to manage. Southeast yes, Asia. yeah, Southeast Asia is um, yes. part, of, part of our Asia. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Very good. Next question. Uh, my name is Herman, and I'm a member of uh, National Press Cup in Washington. Uh, just a few days back, the Jap Japanese government has announced that it will increase 5% for its defense budget. And my question is, how does the U.S. view that kind of plan? Because I understand that Japan is very, the closest ally of the U.S., since also U.S. has uh, huge military bases in Japan, Okinawa. And how do you see the political, move, political maneuver of Japan? Because just two days ago, there was a summit meeting between ASEAN and Japan. How do you see the connection between defense increase and political maneuver with, with, with ASEAN by Japan? And how do you see China reacts to that kind of Maneuver. Thank you. Should I take that? Yes, please. Um, <laughs> please. You well, are the Japan chair, yeah. so. The, uh, the Japanese government actually, Tuesday, uh, which means in a few hours, uh, or right about now, Japan time, is putting out its new, uh, it's putting out three documents. Uh, the first national security strategy out of their new NSC. Um, a new uh, national defense program uh, guideline document, sort of like our QDR, and then the midterm defense plan, which is a list of squadrons and um, a, a, a sort of planning um, outline of what they're going to procure. <clears throat> um, and it's already out in the press, and they've been briefing it from Tokyo. And uh, you know, the defense budget should increase by about 1.7 per uh, uh, cent uh, a year. Uh, which is good from the U.S. perspective, um, apropos the morning, the earlier conversation about allies um, uh, getting up towards 2 percent. Japan's still below 1 percent, but that's a good trend, especially given the budget pressures. The shift will be towards air and naval, um, and uh, that's good. Um, but Japan's ability to maintain strategic 
weight within a vacuum contribute to stability in the region cannot be fully met by um, defense spending or even creating an NSC or res removing restrictions on exports alone. Um, it's going to require more active Japanese security cooperation with other partners. So I think from the U.S. perspective, I'm not in the administration, but I, I know the administration's on the record saying they strongly welcome the changes in Japan's defense policy, and I can't imagine they would be anything other than positively disposed towards stronger Japan ties with ASEAN, Australia, and, and others. The tricky part is the inside of the donut, um, what is the Japanese strategy to reassure uh, Korea, which is important to us, um, and we have some role in that. And then how do you get the right mix where you're um, uh, convincing our friends in Beijing that aggressive things like aid is, if they keep happening, are going to create more of these networks without you know, either saying we're going to continue or worse, saying we're going to continue and then not being able to do it. <laughs> because all of these other partners in ASEAN have strong economic and in some cases political ties with Beijing. That's why this you know, this federated capabilities concept is so important to our strategy in Asia, because a one-size-fits-all process won't work, but something that strengthens our, the capacity of countries around the region and our links with them and their links with each other, um, which is, you know, sort of adjusted depending on, um, on, on whether they're allies and so forth, um, that, that, that not only is it an opportunity, I think without it, the so-called rebalance won't work. Rebalance is not going to work if we're just moving some Marines around and making speeches. Okay, very good. Let's have time for maybe two more questions. One right here, and then let me just take the, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, and one over here. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I, my question, it isn't really a, a question. Looking at Africa, I come from Kenya, where we have on the Indian Ocean, and looking at the piracy and what is happening in Somali and other parts and with AFRICOM being in uh, Germany. How do you look at incorporating the uh, federated uh, defense into Africa yes. in the future? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and just to go one more time through the three major topics we're, we're covering, the first is the global defense supply chain, which will be relevant wherever that supply chain takes us. And I imagine that right. it at least takes us a little bit into <clears throat> Africa. Yes. Um, then we get to the issues of how we improve international defense cooperation, and that I think will be applicable. That, that's what I consider our foundational work, both of those, applicable globally. Then into the deep dives of the regions, and we were, we're planning to start with Asia. We will then, while still working Asia, we will move to doing Middle East, and then we'll move beyond that. So I imagine in 2015, we will be able to take a deeper dive look beyond the foundational work at Africa, at Latin America, at Europe, um, and maybe some of the other sub-regions. Um, so that's our work plan right now. And we do think the concept is applicable globally, but we are limited by our own resources. Um, for anyone who would like to give us more resources to look at problems, we can usually expand our, our available time accordingly. But right now, that's how we've scoped the program. Thank you. Um, I'm curious a little bit about how the traditional security assistance authorities that you've um, kind of laid out will play into the federated defense. Obviously, some of these countries are not on the FMS track. They're on the foreign military financing track. And so how have you thought through those issues in particular? Thanks. Uh, that was Jen Taylor, I believe, right? You didn't introduce yourself. But uh, um, uh, I think what we're going to do is, is twofold. One is, is from the broader process point of view, we really want to look at where the exceptions need to be made and where the, where the boundary conditions are. Um, but I also think that from a bottom-up perspective, we're going to look for a couple of early successes, as, as, uh, particularly as, as the previous panel uh, outlined. Um, and I think those will primarily be in an Asia focus. I think that's going to be where our, our initial uh, fold comes into play, both at the higher end, the U.S.-Japan, U.S.-Korea, but also, I think, looking at Southeast Asia and some of the potential there. Key to it as well, though, I think, uh, uh, Jen, is, is the third-party relationships. I think there will be some cases where we'll be looking that the U.S. is not necessarily in the lead, but the U.S. is playing a supporting role. Perhaps the Australians are in the, in the lead, perhaps the Japanese are in the lead, perhaps the Koreans are in the lead, and I think we'll look for opportunities there in the very near term as well. And just because I completely ignored this side of the room, is there a question over here before we close? Thank you. Sorry. 
I've been watching this side of the room. They've been very awake and alert the whole, the whole time. <laughs> hey, thank you. Greg Hicks here at CSIS on loan from State Department. You, you talked a little about global supply chains and about the interaction of those with defense trade controls. Um, there's another way to, to work this angle, and that's through investment by partners from overseas. But that brings in the question of CFIUS. And I was just wondering if you all were taking a look at that. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think that what you've laid out really is the other end of the spectrum. Ultimately, what we want is enhanced global capability in a way that aligns with both U.S. interests and, and the interests of our, our partners and allies. Um, that does require uh, a recognition of the value of foreign direct investment, a recognition of the value not only at the front end of the CFIUS part of the process, but at the back end as well of once you're actually in the game, being able to actually identify, bid on, and win uh, contracts in a, in a global competitive environment. I think all of that has to come into play. Uh, it makes for a much more complicated uh, uh, analytical approach, if you will. I was thinking earlier, as you were going through your list here, you know, uh, in the end we get to global peace and then we get to put our feet up and, uh, and say, okay, let's go do something else. But I don't anticipate that we'll reach that in, in fiscal year 14. Well, with that, <laughs> with that encouraging end note, uh, I want to thank everyone for coming today. Uh, it's always difficult to talk about a project when you've just barely started it. So my hope is that we can come to you in six months, nine months, with some of our initial output from the three major studies we're launching right away, the global supply chain look, the defense, international defense cooperation, and the Asia work. Um, and uh, get your um, appetites whetted through this event and through that for further work that we will do throughout 2014 and 2015. So thank you very much for coming today, and we look forward to further engagements. Thank you.